Hello, and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy and humanities more broadly for management, engineering, but also for our everyday lives. Um, my name is Andrei Pavlov, and I'm professor of strategy and performance here at the School of Management. And I'm Toby Thompson. Uh, I'm the studio director here at Cranfield, and my interest is in Heidegger uh, and in executive education and the whole continental philosophy theme. And our guest today is Professor Halvard Lillehammer, Professor of Philosophy at Bergbeck, University of London. Halvard, welcome. Welcome to Cranfield. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Halvard, could I just uh, open this uh, conversation in a slightly unconventional way? Um, and I'm, uh, I'll, I definitely have a few questions about your background uh, and, and kind of your research interests in philosophy. But could I uh, start by asking about the uh, course uh, in philosophy for business students that you taught at Cambridge University and then uh, at Ber Birkbeck. This is something that we are doing at Cranfield as well. And this is extremely interesting to us, to both me and, um, and Toby. And I'm dying to, uh, to know uh, or to ask you about, the, uh, about your experience of doing this. How did it come about? about what, what's it like? And, um, and what's the thinking behind it? Um, well, the way that the the course that I've been teaching recently works is that it's uh, it's meant to supply you with a conceptual critical toolkit to think about issues that arise uh, when you work in an institution such as a bank, but not necessarily a commercial institution. It could be a public institution. And so we start with the idea that there are certain kinds of questions that we need to ask. Um, that are, if you like, normative or evaluative, because we have rules and regulations and, and, and structures that we work within, but they're always flexible and they're malleable and we have to apply rules within them and we have to exercise our judgment on when we do so. And sometimes we, we disagree with the rules and the regulations and the norms. And so we find that ethics is, is everywhere. And then most of the course is taken up focusing on certain kinds of questions that arise ethically when we work in institutions and gives a kind of a way to think about those critically. So we think about concepts like integrity, truthfulness, manipulation, trust, trustworthiness, and so on and so forth. And what the course aims to do is to give the student a way to think about what kind of assumptions that are embodied in how institutions employ those concepts, how they're understood in people's lives when they work within institutions. We give people a conception of what alternative ways there are of thinking about those concepts, how to apply them to cases, to, to examples. And then towards the end of that course, although it happens as it were by application throughout, we raise some of the big questions. So we take some of the big sort of, we might call them ideological or principal claims about the justification of, say, a market system and say, mm -hmm. look, now we have this conceptual toolkit. Let's look at some of those arguments and see what assumptions they make about those kinds of concepts and see how good those arguments are at the end of the day. And the thought is that the students will now have a, some of the resources to do that in a slightly more intelligent way or slightly more articulated way than they did before. Uh, so it's really a way of helping the students to acquire a vocabulary, a taxonomy, a set of concepts to do the critical thinking that they probably do anyway, but perhaps at the end of the course with a little bit more conceptual texture and sophistication. Mm. And these are business students or uh, what's, what's their background? What sort of degree are they pursuing? Well, so I've been teaching students with various backgrounds for this uh, type of course. Um, um, when we taught it at Cambridge University, it was first MBA students who mm -hmm. took this course as an elective. Uh, then it was executive MBA students who took it again as an elective. At Birkbeck, it's been a mixed set of students. Uh, some of them have been humanities students. Some of them have been management students, people who do degrees in management or accountancy. Philosophy students, both graduates and undergraduates, and so a wide variety of uh, people's of backgrounds. Uh, some people have are professionals who do philosophy, as it were, on the side. Some people are not professionals, uh, and that's quite important. Certainly, the way the course is developed, because it's quite clear that 
the idea of developing this conceptual toolkit for how to think about your ethical place in an institution is something that has quite a broad application. And so depending on who the students are at any given time, you can adjust perhaps by thinking of what examples to use uh, the discussion to the kind of institutional environment uh, that the students are more familiar with. So some in some classes, it'll be a very commercial environment. In some cases, it'll be a very high powered environment. For example, you're dealing with an executive MBA class. But in another class, it might be it, it, it might be students who, who don't have so much experience, say, with the business world or of of, uh, of a high, high, high levels of management, in which case you you can apply this conceptual toolkit to to their experiences. Mm. And so what are some what are some of the tools in that toolkit? What are you hoping to equip them with? Well, I mean, a good example of something that is very topical these days is uh, manipulation. And uh, to what extent uh, should we be worried about, as it were, uh, the fact that uh, we live in this high tech culture in which uh, there are machines that run algorithms that we're not aware of, that decide what we see when we put up, when we go on our YouTube feed or that decide what we do when we, when we go on Google, that decide what kind of news we get when we to find out what happens around in the world. So we have we ask ourselves to, to, to what extent does this interfere with the idea that we are freely choosing things, that we are in charge of our own information search, that we are in charge of making our own decisions, that we are autonomous agents who, as it were, develop our ethical or professional sensibility in a way that is somehow under our control. Mm -hmm. So one thing that the philosophical toolkit can provide you with is a, is a set of different ways of understanding what autonomy, freedom, choice consists in and how, depending on what kind of a model you choose to think about it, it will or will not be more or less true or more or less problematic to say that you're choosing or deciding to find out something freely. Mm. And how do, how do the students respond to this? And, and how do you actually then, I suppose two questions in one, um, how, how do you bring this, um, the, this machinery of kind of philosophical ideas and concepts into the into the lectures into the classroom do you ask the students to read philosophy do you provide lectures so that's one side of the question and the other side of the question is well so what's the uh, what's the reaction what's the response what do you get back from them well i mean so there are th i think there are three questions there so what's the mode of 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 delivery first well normally what we'll do is we'll do a combination of lecture and the discussion in a seminar Mm -hmm. uh, normally there'll be some reading. It could be a piece of very theoretical philosophical reading, or it could be something a little bit more applied. But certainly in most recent years, there's always been some academic article that presents a certain point of view. In terms of how the students respond, I think the interesting thing about this topic, which is not unique to this topic, it's common in philosophy, is that students will have different reactions. And so it's not usually very difficult to generate, say, an example uh, that where you can apply this particular question to, to, to a real world case and ask people's opinions about it. And normally in a class, one can elicit people's responses and find a variety of views. And then you can spend some time in the class asking the people as were on each side of a, of a question why they have the view that they have. And they will then be able to explain in the words that we have we've decided to operate with, why they think that, for example, something is a problematic form of manipulation or why they think it's not a problematic form of, of, mm -hmm. of manipulation. I mean, give you a, a cl classic example in terms of advertising, for example, which is something I always talk about in, 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 in every class of, on this course. Uh, some some people might think that there is something deeply problematic in which, but, but, but means of which customers are always being manipulated in advertising particularly because there are these messages that, as it were, are not explicit. And then some students might say, well, actually, you know, most communications have various aspects to them that are not made explicit. So does that mean all communication is manipulative? And then we can have a discussion about that, thinking about different kinds of cases, some from advertising and some not from advertising, and, and, and see, how, see how it goes. I mean, the aim in a, in a philosophy class is normally not to keep them in the room and, and not let them leave until they will sign that they agree with a certain <laughs> proposition. But you know, occasionally there is a drift towards a certain view, and sometimes, sometimes there is. And oh, just last go, question. Go on. Um, I know Toby's dying to ask you all <laughs> sorts of questions, um, but last question, I suppose, from me. 
Um, so what do you think um, on, a, on a broad scale, uh, what do you think the students get out of this course? Well, I guess you have to ask them. Uh, but uh, I think what they might get out of this course is the ability to think about questions that many of them will have thought about already, because they are all students who select to do this course, they're not forced to do this course, but to do so in a way that allows them to articulate their thoughts and perhaps their thoughts that they now have that they didn't have before, with a vocabulary and a set of sort of theoretical constructions that allows them to be a little bit more articulate and sophisticated in giving a reason for why they believe the things that they believe. I mean, at the end of the of the class, at the end of the course, you might have a discussion with someone outside university about the same topic as you had with them the year before. And the hope would be that the way you carry on that conversation might be slightly different at the end of it than it was at the beginning. That's one thing you can achieve. Uh, I think it's uh, not particularly realistic to think that you, will, that you will achieve having sold them a particular political or philosophical ideology. That's uh, that's not really part of the of the course. Yeah, but hopefully that's I do for think the aim, people, yeah. I, I do think people change their minds about things. And you do get student feedback or you do get students writing to to us afterwards saying that they've actually used some of the thinking that they've come across in the course in the course of their of their work and it has helped them and sometimes allowed them to to do things that they didn't do before. Mm. Toby. Howard, I'm intrigued about you and I guess those people that are watching and thinking, well, I could do what Howard is doing. That's easy. He's just asking a bunch of questions. What's your background? How did you come to this? So I, my background is in, in moral and political philosophy. So I was brought up in the, the so-called Anglophone tradition of, uh, of, uh, of, of philosophy, which meant that I read mainly contemporary, but also some historical uh, writers on this topic. So what I'm familiar with is, you know, certain types of theories about how you justify how society is constructed, how you justify the existence of certain institutions such as markets or public services, how you apply those theories to certain kinds of cases, uh, for example, in the in the ethics of, of the professions, uh, for example, how do you justify that in some parts of professions, when some people are doing well, necessarily other people will, will do badly. Uh, the, the ethics for adversaries, as, as, as it's called in the in the in a book by by Brian Applebaum. So I have that theoretical background, uh, and before I started teaching students who study business uh, and professions like that, uh, I had some experience working in in biomedical ethics. So I was working with people in the uh, late 90s and early noughties uh, in when the big topic was the genome. And so I have some experience talking to people as it were across disciplinary boundaries or from academia to outside academia about how abstract ideas that we theorize in philosophy have applications in institutions. So I was familiar with the idea of ethics and ethics in institutions, but until I taught uh, students uh, on the MBA in Cambridge, I had never taught business students before. So for me, that was a question of adapting a certain way of thinking about how philosophy could be applied to a new kind of profession or a new kind of institutional context. God. I'm intrigued God. by your notion of indifference, because you've written papers on indifference and maybe indifference as a virtue. Um, how are you expecting people to come to your conversations? Because I guess indifference is, I don't know, or is indifference something more than that? Well, so, um, when it comes to that particular topic, uh, one of the things that we try to bring to the student's attention is the idea that uh, in professions, or actually in most walks of life, we cultivate certain dispositions, which uh, in a certain context might be thought to be a very bad one, but in another context might be necessary. And so we are, as it were, um, engaging in a certain kind of uh, div in internal ethical division of labor. So if you think about the fact that in order to perform a certain type of task, well, you have to concentrate on it. Uh, and in order to concentrate on that task, you have to block out other things that you don't concentrate on because otherwise you won't do your task well. And that means that in that context, you are indifferent to those things you're blocking out. 
And that might be not just a virtue, it might be a necessary thing for you to be able to form your your job well. Uh, let me give you an example from yesterday, as I watched some uh, some sport on TV. Uh, somebody was taking a, a penalty kick in a football match. Imagine taking a penalty kick in a football match in front of the opposing supporters, and they're shouting abuse at you, right? Now, of course, it's possible that somebody might take that to be a motivating feature of scoring the penalty. But another way of thinking about it is that you just block out all that negativity in order to concentrate on scoring your goal. So you're you're cultivating a certain set of indifference to it in that situation. And that might be an absolutely essential thing to do to concentrate on doing your task. Similarly, in professions, in business, in order to concentrate on your task, you have to block certain things out in order to realize your ends. But the problem, of course, is that has a flip side. Because if you concentrate on it exclusively, you might actually miss out on certain kinds of things in your environment that you should be aware of. And then you might end up in a state which is not a virtue, it's a, it's, a, it's a bad state, which I call blinkered indifference, where you basically don't take account of certain kinds of relevant features of the environment in which you find yourselves because you're so concentrating on realizing the means to your ends. And this is a topic which, I mean, philosophers haven't, in my tradition, haven't really historically theorized to a great extent, but philosophers in other traditions uh, on the continent and people in sociology and other parts of the, of the social sciences have been very aware of this fact that this kind of what I call blinkered indifference has, has seriously difficult and pernicious effects. And of course, when you think about teaching um, students in a business context who perhaps want to or are already work in the professions, the obvious example to think about there is, is profit chasing. Profits chasing for the sake of it, profit chasing at the cost of anything, and no, regardless of what the or what the collateral damages of doing so. So the notion of indifference, as it were, and how it's cultivated intelligently or not intelligently sits straight in the middle of what I think of as, of, as core business ethics. So I'm linking impartiality to indifference or indifference to impartiality, and then possibly onward to objectivity. And I'm thinking of Thomas Nagel, of course, at The View From Nowhere. Would you ascribe mm. to Nagel's view that there is such a thing as The View From Nowhere? Um, no, I don't subscribe to his uh, his conception of a view from nowhere or the idea of an of a what Bernard Williams' alternative called an absolute conception of uh, of the world. But I do subscribe to the idea that what those philosophers have provided us with is a model for thinking about how we can detach more or less from a particular point in time or a particular subjective or time relative point of view on the world, and that sometimes we not only are encouraged to, but we need to do so in order to see the world from a slightly, as it were, more impartial or more universal or more less historically specific standpoint. And this can be a very important and a good thing to do, but also, of course, it can sometimes be a problematic thing. Mm. <laughs> Is this connected to the notion of, of as I'm bringing it back, I suppose, to, to managers and organizations. Is it connected to the notion of um, moral muteness um, that, uh, that I know you, um, you talk about in your class as well? Yes, I think uh, one way of thinking about the notion of moral muteness, which is not my term, um, is that it arises when people are encouraged to pursue a certain kind of maybe blink at indifference, uh, perhaps through profit chasing or perhaps through a certain competitive spirit in a team, so at the exclusion of certain other things, which A, not only are ethically significant, such as the effects you have on others who may not have chosen to be in that situation, so there, there might be the, the innocent bystanders, but also at the cost of what you're really thinking and feeling. So one of the curious things about about the notion of moral muteness is the phenomenon where someone is uh, actually motivated in ways that are not indifferent or hostile to people around them. Perhaps they're someone is motivated to help someone, but because the environment they find themselves in is very competitive, they're encouraged to, as it were, suppress that fact or not communicate that fact. So somebody might say that they only did something because it would pursue profit or they only did something because it was in their own self-interest. Well, actually, that's not even true. It's just that in that situation, it's not felt to be appropriate to admit that actually 
your interest was a little bit less selfish or a little bit profiteering than than uh, than you make it out to be. We live in the age, however, <coughs> of the sovereign individual. Maybe we've always lived in the age of the sovereign individual. It, it, me and what I want and what I do is everything. The objective subjective distinction, that duality, isn't that a little bit, a little bit old hat? You, you seem to be happy with that. Uh, I think that uh, the notions of objectivity and subjectivity can be thought of in various ways. So the way you introduced it was in terms of sort of detaching from myself and seeing things from a broader point of view. There's nothing old hat about that. I mean, think about uh, your, your, the effects of your behavior on the environment. You can think about that from the perspective of yourself right now in this room in, in the next five minutes. Or you can think about yourself as an individual in 2023 as part of a, a, a long historical process of people like us doing certain kinds of things in universities. I mean, that's one way of thinking about it more objectively. That's just one way of thinking about the objective and the subjective. With respect to the sovereign individual, that's one of those great philosophical, politically, uh, how can I put it? Uh, Charged. <laughs> a a, a charged notions, which, of course, at some level of, of analysis uh, is a fiction. Uh, but it's a fiction that, in my opinion, which uh, can be usefully mobilized to think about certain kinds of things, uh, namely the value of individuals. Um, but uh, in certain ways of thinking about the idea of the sovereign individual, I think it's a, it's a deeply problematic notion myself. It's interesting because you mentioned earlier on high-powered executives, on a high-powered executive MBA. Executive uh, includes the Latin word sequi, which is sequence. Executives carry out. They sequence out things. Um, it seems like you're a blocker. Uh, the philosophy is a blocker. Let me just carry stuff out. I don't need this stone in the shoe. I just need to carry something out. Yeah, I think we, we will often be confronted by people who are very aware of, as it were, the institutional incentives and disincentives to stop and think or ask certain questions, right? Now, two things about that. The one thing is, of course, in my experience teaching these topics, most of the students who come to study with us have chosen to do so. So there are executives among them, but they have chosen to do so presumably because they've asked themselves those questions. So they're interested in thinking about is it a blocker? What kind of blocker is it? When should I not worry about the blocker? When is it okay for me to ignore about, ignore the blocker, et cetera, et cetera? So in some sense, we tend to speak to slightly um, easier audiences. Although I have to say, I've had, <laughs> there have been years when some of the students have, have ha had rather more, as it were, practical concerns and have not been so interested in that aspect of the, of the conversation. But going back to the very beginning of our conversation, even uh, executives who consider certain types of fundamental philosophical problems as blockers, because they are ultimately wanting to do the jobs that they have chosen well, even they find themselves in situations where they have to apply the rules mm. that they don't fundamentally want to reject. And applying a rule itself mm. involves a certain element of judgment. You have to use your ethical sensibility to think, how do I apply this rule now? You know, as the, the British, of course, are famous about, about this. They, uh, it's not just the British, but but they are famous about this, which which reminds me of when I was a student, uh, and there was a rule in 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 the college where I was a student, which said that, you know, all students had to wear formal attire when they went to see a a, a college officer. This rule is not enforced. <laughs> okay, is it a rule? Yeah, it rem <laughs> reminds me of. Um, I might be I might be paraphrasing rather than quoting Wittgenstein, but. Um, uh, his dictum about rules that whatever whatever rule you give me i'll give you a rule that justifies my use of your rule <laughs> well, that's, yeah that's a that's that a good like, one sounds yeah. like wittgenstein um could i just ask you since we're, we're talking about um about your current research uh harvard and or or not current research but i suppose your your interest and your um angle at these philosophical questions uh, your most recent book is an edited volume on the trolley problem. And uh, when I saw it, I thought that that's really interesting because the trolley problem, in a way, I mean, has come to be almost like a stereotypical uh, thought experiment that's taught to every starting PhD, PhD every starting uh, philosophy student. Uh, and is there anything new to say about this? 
And so I was really interested to see that there is a 2023 volume on this. And I really wanted to ask you about, um, about this. Um, so could you maybe just say a little bit about what the trolley problem is for our audience as well, but also what are the current uh, debates and what is the current thinking about it? Well, okay, so the trolley problem is um, a problem about choosing in a tragic or difficult situation where no matter what you do, somebody will be harmed. Uh, in the classic scenario, it's about saving lives. Um, it's a, situation, a set of situations where you can save more lives by causing other people to die. Uh, and the problem arises because there are situations in which it might be easy to say that you should always save the greatest number of lives or you should cause as few deaths as possible. But there are other situations where the numbers are the same and you say the opposite. Can you give us so an you're example, faced with yeah. something like, not like an aporia, but you're faced with a situation of having to explain why is it that in one situation it's okay for me to cause the death of one to save five, and in another situation it's not okay. What is it? What kind of, what assumptions, what ethical assumptions do we bring to bear trying to explain why we behave this way in this situation and this way in another situation? So sometimes the, the pro trolley problem is used in teaching to confront people with these puzzles and to ask the students or ourselves whether we can find a coherent way to think ourselves out of them, to find a coherent way to explain what's the difference between these cases. So it's really at the very abstract level, a challenge about what's a morally relevant difference and how does it work? Mm. With respect to the question of where the research is now, I mean, one of the interesting things about this uh, from the point of view of the his history of the discipline is that this was discussed primarily by philosophers uh, after the introduction of this particular dilemma in the late 1960s, incidentally in the context of a public discussion about the morality and legalization of abortion. That's where it first was introduced. In the UK, isn't it? Yeah. In the UK. Yeah. Now, what happened was that for about for a few decades, it was mainly discussed by philosophers uh, in a way that your, your question suggests they just went round and round and round, as you, as you might say. <laughs> but what then happened was that it was picked up outside of philosophy, including in, in, in psychology, uh, where these kinds of vignettes and, 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 and very simple uh, schematic challenges were used to, to try to understand what the psychological mechanisms are that operate in our minds when we make practical decisions. So if, in some sense, the, the, the topic became a, a, an interdisciplinary research program without ever having, as it were, intended to be such. Mm. So one of the things that was interesting to me, looking back on it after, after about 50 years, was um, where, 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 what happens when you try to bring these discussions together and what, what do we actually learn about our moral sensibility when we think about these different ways in which uh, a we learn something about ourselves by thinking about these uh, about these examples or these these vignettes, uh, but also we're trying to find out something about as it were what the right thing to do is by thinking about these vignettes. For me, therefore, the question was, and of course that's a very personal thing, uh, you know, whether this is a, whether this is something that should be should be deeply disturbing to us, that there, is, that there are these cases, very simple cases that you can confront people with, which seem to present us with situations where we, we have nothing to say, mm. because it, there's a sense in which um, we feel kind of clueless very quickly. Could but at you, the same time, but yeah, at the but, same time, this yeah, is very important ahead, yeah, too, yeah. at the same time, it, it does not thereby undermine the courage of our convictions completely about being able to make certain type of ethical decisions. So we need to find some kind of balance between, oh, here are these difficult cases that we don't know what to do with. Here are some cases we, we definitely do, do know how to do it. And how are we going to, is there a way for us to articulate a coherent way of thinking about our ethical sensibility uh, in light of thinking about these cases? And it's mm. a difficult question. And, and I don't think that even though people have been thinking about it for 50 years, uh, the general questions that it arises will stop anytime soon. So I was going to say, could you give us an example of where that dynamic might be at play, uh, where these diff different and difficult considerations might arise? Uh, well, so there are 
I mean, there was there was one which I don't really want to go into uh, because it's. Uh, um, Yeah, because it, it quickly gets us down a, a, a track which uh, might quickly become tasteless. But, uh, you know, one example where people are using these kinds of scenarios is when they design protocols for the for the ethics of, of killing in war. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a slightly less uh, problematic example would be the example of whether we can use uh, vignettes or structural examples of this nature to articulate what kind of design we should have when we automate certain kinds of um, protocols for how machines behave, such as driverless cars or robots that move us around. Mm. Uh, so there is a literature at the moment, it's quite lively literature about, uh, uh, suppose you want to think about what kind of uh, algorithms should be uh, embodied in, in cars that no longer are driven by people, what kind of decisions should the cars make? And at what point do you, for example, insist that there should be a, a, a manual override so that a, that a person takes back control of what happens to the car? To what extent do you outsource, as it were, the decisions that the cars make in situations of risk where people's lives, for example, or people's health might be at stake? Like, for example, if the car, quote unquote, uh, if the car needs to decide whether to sacrifice the passenger or um, or the pedestrian, or a number of pedestrians. Or is it? Am I thinking in the right direction here? Yeah, exactly. That's that's what the that's what the current literature is about. And some people think that you that some of the the the, the examples and some of the theory that the philosophers have been able to articulate can help us to think more clearly about those things. But of course, there is no simple application of the theory to practice because you have all the complications of of the law, of of what, how the machines work, and so on and so forth. Not a topic on which I'm an expert, uh, but it's quite clear that the, that the, the the these kinds of vignettes, which which looked kind of trivial and and uh, maybe it was sort of irresponsible in in the abstract, actually have some use to think about some real real world cases. However, why is it that philosophy is so hard? Listening to you talking, goodness me, this is really hard. What are what are some of the misconceptions that the general public or the business community have about philosophy? Uh, well, I think one of the things that I often come across is the idea that what the philosophers have is a set of, or what the philosophers who aspire to have is a set of theories which can be applied, as it were, uh, directly to the world so as to to use a word of a former colleague, to so as to give us an autopilot for life. <laughs> um, and uh, to the extent that the philosophers struggle with the possibility of finding an autopilot for life, philosophy has a problem and, and is, is something we should be suspicious of. So I think the, 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 the possibility of coming up with an autopilot for life, I think that is something one should be skeptical about, not just in practice, but also I think, as, as it were, ethically and philosophically, there's something very dubious about the idea that we should even aspire to that thing. But it sounds so like what we do. Oh, sorry, go ahead. What we do as philosophers is we try to come up with ways of thinking more intelligently about questions that we admit are very difficult, even if we don't believe that the end result of our thinking or discussion is to come up with an autopilot for life. So it sounds like you believe that you can cultivate a taste for philosophy a kind of habit, a judgment. It sounds like that's what you're recommending. Yeah, so I'm uh, an optimist in the following sense. I think that it's possible to think more intelligently about difficult problems in the context of knowing that we're fallible, in the context of knowing that there's not always perhaps a single right answer, that we might make decisions that we have to live with, even though if we think about them later, we would have made a different decision. But nevertheless, there are lots of really stupid decisions that we can avoid. And sometimes thinking philosophically about the problems, we'll make less stupid decisions. <laughs> mm. So what do you think is the main principle of philosophy, uh, especially, especially the principle that could be applied and transferred to other fields? Is it reason? Is it doubt? Is it um, debate? 
Anything I think uh, the idea of being critical and self-reflective is ultimately the the one thing that I bring to the table when I think about uh, what philosophy has to offer. But I'm not an essentialist about philosophy, what philosophy is. I don't think it does just one thing. And when someone does something slightly different and call themselves a philosopher, that's just fine by me. I don't think uh, I want to spend my life arguing about who owns or about who owns that label. You wouldn't police the discipline. No, that's not my style. I mean, I do realize that uh, there are people who do that. In fact, I've I've had colleagues who, who like to do that. But that's just, I, th I think that certainly is something that has had its time. But of course, There's... we work in institutions. We are, of course, also professionals. And so sometimes to have the definitional power is, is a way to get hold of the resources and so you can see that there's definitely incentive to oh, have a long discussion yeah. about philosophy, what philosophy really is. It does reminded me of a very famous paper in, in management, which is called Umbrella Advocates versus Validity Police. And it's about uh, two, two different groups of people. So people who tend to say, well, no, this is a broad umbrella and we could have multiple conversations under it. Or no, what is, what is really, what is this concept? And, you know, the kind of policing the validity of it. But that's by the by, anyway. Toby, sorry. Yeah, well, how... I grew up... Go on. Go ahead, go go on. ahead Howard. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to Toby then. Well, I was going to say, you, you've seen this field, the, the applying or the practical philosophy, you've seen this over the years. You seem to have a real interest in that area. How have you seen that develop over the years, assuming it has? Um, I see that, uh, I mean, our, our contribution as philosophers to these questions... In general, uh, I think we should be modest about what we were able to achieve. Um, what I see more than what's being achieved is I see that there are there is the what I called earlier the philosophical toolkit that that is used sometimes quite usefully, but in different areas at different times. So when I started out as a philosopher, as I said earlier, the big thing was the genome. I think philosophers have made some interesting the contributions to the discussion, the general societal discussion about how we should think about issues to do with um, our knowledge of genetic and a mastery of genetic technologies. More recently, or actually in the presence, there's a lot of talk about uh, machines, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. I can see the same kind of toolkit being applied slowly by philosophers to that topic. I don't think the philosophers will, you know, own those questions because they're complicated questions, they're sociological questions, historical questions, scientific questions, political questions, legal questions. But I think philosophy has a has a role to play in those. Um, so I think I think about it, I guess, in terms of making a contribution to different things at different times. Uh, sometimes helpfully and sometimes uh, notoriously not so helpfully. <laughs> I think I certainly see an explosion of interest in philosophy in general uh, on the part of uh, the general public, lay people like myself, for example, in the sense that um, you now see philosophy books uh, on the self-help sections of um, bookstores, you have philosophy podcasts, you have different programs introducing philosophy. So I think to me it seems like there is a more general interest in the philosophical ideas and concepts in the broader society. Does that match what you see as well? Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there, there's, there's certainly uh, a lot of talk, but I think, uh, I think it depends a little bit on the, the reputation that a certain contribution makes at a certain time. So there are certain examples of philosophers in the public realm that have been very, that can be used to sort of defend your view. I think the, the recent uh, influence, for better or for worse, of something like effective altruism, the effective mm -hmm. altruism movement, mm -hmm. is a good example of how something that started as a philosophically theoretical project has become public. Uh, and some people think that's a great thing, and some people think, oh, well, look what happened there terrible thing. Um, what I think is more problematic in, in terms of justifying that hypothesis is that um, 
I think there's a there's an interest in the questions, but there's not necessarily such much so much patience in thinking about going deeply into those questions in the way that uh, yeah. we would like to do as philosophers. That is so um, true. That is. I mean, true. Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein is allegedly someone who said that the motto of the philosophers should be "take your time." <laughs> and if taking your time is something that is important in philosophy, then I think there's a sense in which the world we live in now is not philosophy friendly because it wants headlines, it wants snappy things, it wants 1.5 minutes on YouTube and actually to mm. go and spend a lot of time going deeply into some material to try and understand it uh, from more than one direction in its historical context. Uh, that's something that there is it's not almost so much patient for, even in universities where more and more of the stuff that we're supposed to be delivering is little packets of information that can be sort of uploaded on, on Moodle or some other uh, <laughs> online online service uh, where it has to be, be able to be absorbed by a student in 25 minutes because no one can pay attention for longer than that. I think Ooh. that's not a very philosophical way of thinking of, no. about, about the world, it seems to me. Ooh. So philosophy is hard. People have no time. For those that are watching this video and have gotten this far, congratulations. Um, what would your advice be if they've got a little whiff of, you know what, there's something in this? What, what should they do? I think uh, Wittgenstein's uh, advice is a very good one. Take your time. Yeah, you, you have to find a place to, to concentrate on the question you're dealing with in some sense abstracted away from your the, the run of the mill stuff you do every day uh, before you go back and apply it. I think there's a sense in which I sometimes see this in classes when you try to introduce students to something that is conceptually quite complicated because they are busy people or we are all busy people. The thought is you, well, can you just give me the, can you <laughs> the just answer. give me the, the answer, can you just give me the, the gist, just yeah, yeah, yeah. deliver the package so I can put yeah. it into my work, into arrive my, at your point and, and solve my problem. And as an ethicist, it's very difficult to, to respond to that because of course you'd like, you'd like to help. But you know, I think of the ethos of what I do is I'm, I will try to help you to do your thinking. Hmm. Uh, then you will have to decide for yourself uh, what you want to do. And so the idea of you not doing the thinking is the one that I need to resist. And Ooh. doing the Ooh. thinking requires, it requires time. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's almost like um, insisting on an instrumental value of philosophy destroys the very mm. value of philosophy. Mm. Yeah, there is, there is, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, I suppose, um, kind of thinking about the future uh, a little bit more um where do you where do you see your own work going uh what are you what are you thinking of at the moment what are you what are you reading what's on your intellectual radar screen uh my my work recently has been on a topic which is related to ethics and business but uh not primarily in it um it's about um questions about responsibility for our role in processes, structures, institutions that transcend us, uh, partly uh, in ways where we are either holding ourselves responsible, holding other people responsible, asking ourselves whether we should take responsibility for things which are not primarily of our, of our own doing, and how that affects how we not only criticize people, but how we praise people. I'm primarily interested in um, the concept of praise and the in the idea that uh, there is an, an ethics of, of praising well and mm -hmm. badly. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how that relates to, as it were, how we how we operate as individuals, things that are or are not within our, our control, uh, in ways that challenge what Toby earlier referred to as the, the notion of the, of the sovereign individual. Mm. So what would be some of the dilemmas and thorny questions in in that in that debate well so let's take a simple example um you have uh, two people who are perfectly well trained um there may be let's 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 say they're um they're rescuers on a beach uh, they're there their job is to is to help people who are who are in danger of drowning uh one is on one side of the beach the other is on the other side of the beach 
There's one person drowning on the left-hand side of the beach. The person on the left-hand side of the beach, the rescuer, goes out and rescues them. Everybody's really grateful. They get a prize. They get lots of praise. Uh, does a lot of good things for them. The other guy on the other, or doesn't have to be a guy, on the other side of the beach was ready just to, 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 to help the person as well. It's just that they had the bad luck of there being no one drowning next to them. They don't get the prize. They don't get the same kind of praise. Mm. Is there something unfair about that? You think about what the life chances of these people might be. Uh, they, were, they both had the same intentions. They were well-intentioned. They were good people. It's just that the performance aspect of one person was different from the other person's. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that there's necessarily a deep skeptical puzzle here. I'm not saying that we should not be grateful for the person who rescued the, the person on the left-hand side of the beach. But it's worth thinking about as a way of getting into the question about, you know, to what extent do you think that people's rewards should necessarily be indexed to what they actually have done? Mm. The relevance of that, of course, to business is very clear because uh, Huge. people get uh, rewarded in business for outcomes which in many cases is at least partly due to them just being in the right place at the right time. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And uh, my background in business, of course, uh, is also is not just strategy, but also performance measurement, which comes with all the conversations about uh, incentives, uh, compensation, bonuses, and things like this. And I, I completely agree with you. I mean, even in your scenario, I can think about other implications of, for example, the... Um, the rescuer on the right side now beginning to wish that, well, somebody would be drowning on the right side now. Uh, and is, is, that, is, that a, is that something we want people to wish? Um, then. Yeah, so there is, a, there is an, a, a negative incentive for people who were not fortunate enough to rescue to generate some emergency or something that makes them look indispensable so that they can also yeah, get the reward. I can see that. I can see this could go on for quite some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it would seem applicable not just in a seminar room, but in a boardroom too. The two, that conversation seems just as relevant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I was recently on a on a committee that was actually deciding on rewards within an institution, and some of the discussions that did come up clearly did boil down to this question about you know. It was the luck of so-and-so to have been there at this particular time. But, of course, that allowed them to be able to use that as a, as a way to justify that they were, were doing well in the institution and vice versa. Mm. I have one sort of final general question, but, Toby, do you have... Do no, you, have you go ahead. Um, I, I suppose this is more of a I suppose speculative question. Uh, but taking this back to the conversation about... Uh, ethics in business, uh, what sort of ethical, bigger, biggest ethical, ethical challenges do you see leaders facing in the next, in the, in the foreseeable future, in the next 10 years? What's, what's really uh, on the horizon? Uh, well, I think this is a, not really a philosophical question. This is a question about how I understand, as it were, where our society is at this particular point in time. Mm, indeed. Uh, so I can be more or less subversive. I'll try and pick something in the middle to keep to keep the conversation light. <laughs> I, I think that um, one of the big issues at the moment is that uh, we have private uh, organizations, some of which are uh, profit making, uh, that are extremely powerful. They're international. Their power extends some in some ways much further than many states that of many states. Um, they are more powerful than many states. They have power over many states. And I think a big challenge for, for people who run those institutions and people who deal with those institutions is how to think about what, what is the moral or ethical agency of these institutions and the people within them? Should we think of them more like we think about our, the leaders that we call politicians? Or should we think of them as something separate? And if these distinctions, which theoretically have often been very sharply made, if they get blurred, uh, do we have a way of of dealing with those ethical challenges that doesn't, as it were, subvert some of the basic values that we use to justify how we run our societies, right? Um, should, should we think of uh, the owners of the great multinational corporations as our new kings or queens, 
<clears throat> or should we think about them some other way? I don't think we have a good answer to those questions at the moment as a society. And I think that that's a, a vital thing to think about in the next, uh, in the coming, not just the coming years, but probably for a very long time. Yeah. Toby? Well, no, I've, I've got a final, final abstract question. Confucius or John Stuart Mill? Which to choose? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I've been reading some Confucius recently. That's why it's such a hard question for me to answer. And I haven't read John Stuart Mill for a long time. Although I did read a lot of John Stuart Mill. Uh, I don't know. Can we have both? <laughs> yes, on the desert island, you can have both. And you were taking your time there, which is fantastic to see. You're, you're demonstrating what it is that philosophers should do. Taking the time. <laughs> taking the time. Wow. I suppose final question, and maybe you've already answered it by by saying that the uh, that the um, uh, sort of the dictum of philosophy is take your time. But uh, if there was for for our audience, if there was some one thing that some practical thing that they could do to really feel uh, or experience the value of philosophy, the practical value of philosophy, what would you recommend they do, other than taking the time and reading your book? Oh, no. Uh, you, are you thinking, for example, of uh, one of the students in your in your business ethics classes, or or even one of the students who's already graduated and is out there uh, making those decisions and live and and living the world of practice? Well, maybe I'll, I'll pre present them with the challenge, which is the challenge that I faced very early on as an adult when I decided that I was going to spend more of my time than is strictly speaking uh, healthy to do philosophy. <laughs> um, which is uh, consider a, a, an opinion you hold for, for firmly, something that you believe is important. Ask yourself what reasons you could give for holding that opinion. Confront it with some objections and, uh, and criticism and see how long it holds up. Should that disturb you? I think it's very difficult if you do that honestly, not to think that there's something interesting to go on thinking about at that point. Fantastic. Good answer. Well, Halvard, this was for us on our side, this was a fantastic conversation. We really learned a lot and really enjoyed it, I think, uh, which is which is more important in a way. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your uh, ideas and insights. Halvard, thank you. I'm going to read Confucius. <laughs> good. Great speaking um, to you. And my head is hurting, so thank you for that. Okay, thank you very good. Much.